So as Dan mentioned, we're going to talk about new blood vessel growth, which is this term here, angiogenesis, uh, new blood vessel growth. Uh, you use this every day. If you cut yourself, you obviously need new blood vessels to grow. Uh, that's natural angiogenesis. We're doing what's called therapeutic angiogenesis by injecting a drug into the heart or introducing it into the brain to stimulate uh, new vessel growth. Let me show you what natural angiogenesis, and, and this is a wound bed. Think of this as a scab. <clears throat> you can see underneath this scab you have all these new blood vessels. So that's basically what angiogenesis is. It's new blood vessels which, in this case, uh, regenerate all of the structures of skin. Not only skin itself, but sweat glands, hair follicles, nerve cells. So it's, it's a very, it's a regenerative process, just not one cell type. So with our drug, I'm going to be talking about kind of giving the body a, a significant boost in angiogenesis. Um, for example, think of this as a vessel in a diseased heart, someone with coronary artery disease. Uh, this heart muscle would not be perfused with blood as well. Uh, we inject this growth factor, which I'll talk about in a second. And this is what occurs. And I'll show you uh, clinical trial data from a FDA phase two clinical trial where you can see the actual growth of new blood vessels in the heart. Uh, this process takes about three months uh, to occur, but these patients do much better on treadmill testing. They have less uh, angina, heart pain. And uh, this is one example of angio therapeutic angiogenesis. Okay, so angiogenesis is involved uh, in over 75 human diseases. And insufficient angiogenesis, we know, is involved in stroke and heart disease. These are two uh, diseases that account for more than 50% of deaths in the world. I'm going to show you some data on wound healing where we're able to close uh, diabetic foot ulcers in a FDA uh, phase two trial. I won't talk about excessive angiogenesis, but this is also very important with such things as cancer. Tumors are growing, they need a huge blood supply. So they stimulate excessive angiogenesis to get more blood so they can propagate and grow. And there are drugs on the market that actually inhibit that angiogenesis, they're anti-angiogenesis drugs. So I'm gonna talk about our drug uh, treating uh, foot ulcers. I'll show you clinical trial data where we inject it directly into the heart and then we'll move up to the brain where we're not as far along in those studies, but I think there shows some real promising uh, data in Parkinson's disease and we think it also would be applicable to uh, Alzheimer's disease. Let me tell you a little bit about the uh, drug candidate that we're developing. Uh, it's called human FGF1. It's in our bodies. We use it all the time for wound healing uh, and also internally uh, to develop the natural process. You develop collateral vessels in your heart if there's some issues in, in your heart. But we're introducing large quantities of this protein into the heart, into the brain, and it really does stimulate uh, new vessel growth or angiogenesis. Uh, schematically, this is what angiogenesis looks like. Uh, so here's a blood vessel, capillary. Uh, it's a very tiny growth factor, binds and it starts stimulating tubes. These are little tubes that eventually form new blood vessels. And this occurs uh, obviously multiple places uh, along an existing vessel. So angiogenesis is simply <clears throat> the creation of these new vessels from existing vessels, uh, but you need the stimulation. You need a uh, growth factor. <clears throat> Binding. Okay, <laughs> so are we all right? Okay. Uh, I purify, I was involved in the purification of this product when I was a graduate student a number of years ago from cow brains. Uh, but, and we only got very minute quantities out of cow brains, but now we use recombinant DNA technology to grow up um, as much as we need. Basically, this is bacteria producing this human protein. It's very common, uh, commonly done in the industry. Uh, insulin growth hormone is made this way. 
So let me show you some of the uh, clinical data for this growth factor. Uh, phase two, so three phases of clinical trial. Phase one is safety. Phase two is where you begin to look at, does it work? Is it working? And then the phase three trial before FDA approval is looking perhaps in a large population, 500 to 1,000 uh, patients, so much more heterogeneous uh, patient population. We finished phase two on this one, so we are applying to do phase three. Okay, so there are about five, maybe seven million U.S. people with diabetes. Uh, five to 10% of them develop a diabetic foot ulcer each year. Uh, these are nasty chronic wounds, uh, they're deep, and the dreaded complication is if they get infected. And this can lead to gangrene of the foot and to lower leg or lower foot amputations, which is not a good thing. So this is a topical use of our drug. We actually put it right into the ulcer. We then cover it uh, with a bandage, and we treat these things for uh, five months. And we saw some very remarkable results. First, we do it in animals, though, for the FDA. We test it in uh, diabetic mice that have impaired wound healing. So here you wound the skin of the animal, and this is with our drug. You can see the wound closing uh, after 15 days there where the untreated animal remains open. So we did a very similar type of thing in humans. Uh, the ulcers actually look similar. This is a foot ulcer. Uh, to, uh, this is three weeks before we started any treatment. And then we treated, here the ulcers are closing within 12 weeks. Uh, untreated ulcers are open here at the end of the clinical trial, which was about five months. This is about, uh, I'd say maybe about an inch, but they can get much larger. So we, like an ulcer this side, we get two drops of the drug and then cover it and Bigger ones, we get more drops. That's a pretty simple clinical trial. So you can actually map the acceleration of wound healing uh, in a graph, and this sh shows the treated ulcers are healing about five times, or 4.5, five times faster than the untreated. So this is acceleration of wound healing. But what the FDA wants is, you know, do these things close? Are you getting complete closure of these wounds? And in fact, we did. We got, in this phase two trial, 100% closure within uh, five months. So these are the treated. Uh, untreated are getting pretty good care. They're getting surgical debridement, taking away of all the dead tissue every week in the clinic. Uh, they have special shoes they're wearing. But still, even with that care, uh, about 35% of those wounds are staying open. So this is... Uh, you know, a very nice result. There aren't many things out there that are closing these wounds. Uh, artificial skins have been tried, but we think uh, this really could be a game changer if we can get this approved. Okay, the next indication we have uh, clinical trial data on is in the heart. Uh, again, on the foot, it was a topical application. Here we're injecting the growth factor directly into the muscle the heart muscle, okay? Uh, I'm going to show you a video where it was injected through a little surgical incision in the person's chest, but we're now uh, in phase two. We're using a catheter where you can put it up through the leg, and you come right in here over, this is the aorta, and through the arch, and you can in inject from inside of the heart about 20 times. Let me just show you what one injection looks like. This is uh, an angiogram. So this is a coronary artery that fills with a dye, and then you can image it. Uh, there should be a lot more vessels around here. So this heart muscle is ischemic. It's starving for oxygen, uh, nutrients, and it'll eventually die and lead to heart failure. Here's treatment. Uh, we inject here, wait three months, and you can see on this repeat angiogram, you see all this blush work of new blood vessels in the heart. And you can imagine if we do that 20 times in a person's heart, we can really increase the amount of blood perfusion that these people get in their hearts. 
And I'm going to show you the video now, but you can see in the video the, the cardiologist will show you an angiogram where it's three-dimensional. These You have a three-dimensional network of these new blood vessels. And these patients do much better on treadmill testing, and their angina scores come down uh, remarkably well. So let me just show you. We uh, had about seven sites in our phase one trial. These are all patients. And in Cincinnati, uh, ABC News came and did a story on some of the patients because they were talking about how remarkable they felt. So let me just show you that clip here. Treatment for his blocked arteries, his pain is gone. Now we really feel great. Duke was one of the first heart patients in the country to be treated with a protein actually so capable the, of growing uh, brand FGF new one. arteries. The genetically engineered protein is injected directly into the heart. Within days, a network of new vessels begins to grow around the blockage, increasing the blood supply. Dr. Lynn Wagner showed us the changes in one patient's heart. We see a small, narrow main artery and not so very is... many secondary and tertiary arteries. This is after the treatment. What we're now seeing yeah, is, so this is the blush new work blood of new vessels, vessels right here. growing here uh, off the, the end of this artery. And the patients themselves? Symptomatically, they're improved within a couple of weeks of the treatment. Just ask Constance Donnelly. Oh, I feel wonderful. I've never felt so good in the last five years. It's what doctors already see potential in other cases where the blood supply needs a boost, such as strokes and diabetes. Okay. Uh, that woman, uh, her name was Constance Donnelly. She was probably the most severely affected person in the trial. We had 30 people in this trial. And she was in the lowest dosing group. So we had three dosing groups. She was in the lowest. So her heart obviously was really ready to respond to this drug uh, dramatically. And uh, you know, she was standing there. She came in a, in a wheelchair before the treatment. So that was a nice success. So we're really excited about this and uh, can restart. We're going to repeat the phase two trial since we did that about eight years ago with a different FGF1 manufactured by a different. So the FDA wants us to repeat this uh, same study, but we're very excited about that and uh, hope we can bring it to approval. Yeah, we'll be, they're going to let us do a phase, that was a phase one study, they're going to let us start at phase two, but they want us to repeat the dose, the three dose groups again. Well, realistically, I'd say probably two to two and a half years. Uh, if everything goes well. And with the catheter delivery, it's a little bit easier. You don't need surgery, so it can be done by an interventionalist uh, at an outpatient clinic. Uh, it's a 45-minute procedure. They get in there, pop it 20 times, and then the patient goes home and comes back for treadmill testing in about three months. So, yeah. They are. Uh, not in this clinical trial, but one before that, uh, the patients were looked at three years after the treatment, and those vessels were still there, still patent. They were carrying blood. Uh, some patients develop disease in other parts of the heart, so presumably they would need, at some point, repeat treatment, but it would be in a different area of the heart. So. They stop growing when the uh, area becomes non-ischemic. So if you inject this growth factor into normal heart tissue, nothing will happen. So it has to be ischemic heart tissue. So in some way, once the heart tissue gets better perfused with blood, it, it stops. Yeah. So we don't see blood vessel growth in normal tissues anywhere in the body uh, after we give this drug. And we, have to look, we look very carefully in the eye in the retina, you don't want blood vessels growing in your retina, in the kidney. Uh, and you would not give this drug to anybody with cancer because it would speed up that growth. So we look at our patients very carefully uh, in that regard in terms of having any malignancy. Yeah. Or blocked. So atherosclerosis, they get blocked in the heart. Uh, factor. Uh, 
Well, it stimulates new blood vessel growth. So there's a shortage of vessels in those hearts of those patients. And they're not functioning properly. There's actually decreased number. So we're stimulating new blood vessel growth to bring in more blood. Well, for the heart, it's people who have chest pain and really can't have a bypass or can't have a stent put in for whatever reason. So it's, it's an alternative therapy to a, a bypass procedure. Yeah, two to two and a half years away from approval. Well, we think so, but, <laughs> you know, other people may not. But, yeah, I, I do. I, I believe it would be an alternative to bypass or stenting. Right, so the guy who introduced me, the, the big guy is the uh, business guy. Yeah, so we're, the company's going public in January. And one who's going to be marketing it, yes, marketing all the drugs. Yeah, yeah we have a booth here, so you can learn about the investment at the booth. I, I spend money. I don't... I don't bring money in. <laughs> yeah. It does develop naturally in all these patients. Uh, we have, you know, we all have collaterals, but it's not enough in these very sick patients. They need more collateral circulation. So we're boosting that whole process with this drug. This is just a natural protein. It's like insulin or human growth hormone. It's a growth factor. It's different structure, but it's proteins that we have in our bodies. Yeah, nothing. I, I was involved in isolating it for the very first time and doing the structure. Uh, other people discovered the activity, but they didn't know what was causing the activity. So as a biochemist, we get in there and grind up things and purify it. No gene therapy. No, stay away from that. No stem cells. Just a... Safe, simple protein. No, it's more lifestyle, smoking, you know, high fat diets, small vessels, Indians and uh, women have more of the microvascular disease in the heart. So, you do, you do, exactly. Just what your doctor always tells you. <laughs> So, okay, uh, let's look into the brain now. Uh, so the brain is an incredibly vascularized organ, probably the most vascularized organ in your body. Uh, you have billions of neurons in here that need nourishment, uh, oxygen. And importantly, they, they generate waste products, uh, metabolic waste products that all cells generate, and then it has to be taken, flushed out of the brain. Uh, we know like an Alzheimer's disease, uh, beta amyloid is a toxic protein that accumulates in the brains of people with Alzheimer's. And we believe uh, something which can stimulate new blood vessel growth in Alzheimer's could remove that. And I'll show you some data we have on that with Parkinson's disease. Now work by others, this is not our work, but all of these uh, brain disorders have a suspected microvascular component. Now I'm going to show you some data from Parkinson's, but all of these really kind of devastating diseases, we and others think is initiated by a lack of blood flow you know, in a specific area of the brain. So for example, Parkinson's uh, dopamine neurons in your brain become affected. We think that is initiated by a lack of blood flow to those neurons, which causes them to be choked off and to die. And the same for all these diseases, uh, Lou Gehrig's, MS, Alzheimer's, stroke I'll talk about. Traumatic brain injury, this is PTSD. The military has an interest in that. MSA is a very aggressive form of Parkinson's. Uh, chronic depression, uh, work by others have shown there's low amount of FGF1 in the brains of chronically depressed people, so we're gonna do a clinical study in that. Uh, vascular dementia, and this is CTE. This is what the NFL football players are getting with the kind of uh, concussive head, head injuries. So let me just, one slide, I just want to show you kind of the physiology of what we think is going on in the brain. Uh, it's happening, it's the neurovascular unit. This is where uh, the nerves in our brains 
link up with the vascular, the blood supply. And if we kind of go down from large to smaller arteries, arterioles, and here's the smallest vessels in our brain, the capillary, that's shown here. So this brings the blood supply to each of our neurons. Every one of our neurons basically has a dedicated uh, blood supply, uh, bringing oxygen, uh, nutrients, and as I mentioned, removing waste products. And you can imagine if this gets clogged, you can get clogged by atherosclerosis. Uh, they can be damaged by injury, uh, head injury. Uh, the neurons are not going to be doing as well in this area. So we believe like in Parkinson's disease, the vessels which supply the very small number of dopamine producing neurons in our brains, they're affected, they become dysfunctional, and this leads to the tremor and other uh, characteristics of Parkinson's disease. And one other thing which is important to keep in mind is in our brains, we also have uh, what are called neural stem cells. And these are the, the cells that can regenerate uh, brain tissue. We, scientists just found these about 10 years ago. Uh, we all have them, even people 85 years old. I'll show you a very short video clip at the end of the talk looking at these stem cells in young people and old people. But it, they're very important. Uh, they need blood perfusion to divide and mature, that's the important word, mature. They mature into uh, dopamine producing neurons, uh, motor neurons. So if you can stimulate this pathway, you're gonna have a very nice treatment for these neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Let me show you some data uh, with chronic stroke. This is, uh, I'll show you animal data. We haven't done this in people yet, but you can create, uh, so acute stroke is what happens maybe four to six hours after stroke. Chronic is, in a person, is after they've had a stroke and they kind of settle down and might be three to six months after a stroke. They've lost some type of function and we would try to restore it by giving our growth factor uh, to these stroke patients. Uh, so here's a stroke, uh, get a clot in an artery leading to the brain. This is the carotid or you can get a clot inside the brain and results in a stroke area of the brain, uh, dead neurons. This is called the penumbra. This is brain cells at risk. So if you don't bring more blood into this area of the brain, uh, these cells are going to die and you'll have more disability. So a growth factor, if it could restore blood flow, has a chance of saving this entire area and maybe even repopulating this area of the stroke with uh, new neurons. So we can do this in animals. We don't have da uh, human data on this yet, but in animals, uh, you can give a rat a stroke. You can tie off one of its arteries. And here you can see this is uh, slices of brain of a rat with a stroke. This is the infarcted or white areas stroke region. And if you treat those animals for two to three weeks with our drug, I think very nicely you can see very lessening of the volume of stroke and repopulation of, the, of these areas of the stroke. These are new neurons, uh, new blood vessels are forming here, and these rats, you know, you can put them on these test things, behavioral tests, and they, they do much better. If we look in here, you can actually look at the blood vessels in the brains of these animals, because they're animals, lab animals. You don't want to come back uh, as a lab rat. I can guarantee you that. That's not a, not a good life. <clears throat> uh, but these are the blood vessels in the brains of those animals in the area of the stroke. So without a stroke, they have all these nice orderly capillaries, blood vessels. Uh, you don't see them here, but the neurons would be all, you know, all in this area. You decimate these capillaries with a stroke. Uh, okay. And then if you treat with our drug and wait for two weeks here, or you don't treat, you can see the real difference between these treatment and, and no treatment, that we get revascularization of the stroke region, not quite back to normal, but certainly much better than this tangled, disordered mess of blood vessels in these animals. So these animals perform much worse than the ones which, which we've treated. Yeah, this, most stroke is not hereditary. It's caused by, again, 
It could be lifestyle things where you get blockages. I mean, you know, it could be a genetic component, but uh, these occur uh, kind of randomly, and there's no, I mean, diet and things like that contribute to it. High blood pressure contributes, but so these are naturally occurring events in, in elderly people. Uh, in a similar way to stroke, you can give an animal a traumatic uh, brain injury. These are injuries suffered, for example, in car accidents. Uh, you know, they're, they're traumatic injuries, and you can create a traumatic injury in an animal. This is a mouse brain, normal mouse brain. If you give this brain an insult, uh, 24 hours later you develop a traumatic brain injury, which is shown here. And again, like a stroke, if you treat for, this is for about four weeks, with FGF, our drug, you can see a nice healing of that lesion in these animals. Okay, so again, this is occurring through, if you look in there, new blood vessels are growing, you get new neurons growing, and you're healing uh, this traumatic brain lesion. Okay, now let's look at neurodegenerative diseases. So these are different from, yeah. So in the animals, uh, in the rats, they use, we have a behavioral kind of animal people do, they can do different types of testing. I'm not involved in that, but mazes or how often they, how many rotations they can do on like a treadmill type thing, like you see in a hamster thing. Uh, with, I'll show you, we've done some studies in monkeys where they can measure um, motor skills. So yeah, they're standardized ways of measuring uh, movement in, in animals. Uh, well, <clears throat> I mean, we end the experiments. I don't. We haven't looked at them for you know, years later, but certainly you know, they reach a point where they're not getting where they're not getting full function back. So I'll show you some data with Parkinson's, where in rats we get maybe half the function back, in monkeys we're getting almost eighty percent of normal back. So over time. Uh, this shows a brain of someone uh, with advanced Alzheimer's. Uh, you can see uh, less structural brain tissue here, uh, reduced blood vessels. This is what happens in these patients over time. Uh, they also get toxic accumulation of proteins in their brains. This is called the beta amyloid plaque. And so not only are they losing neurons and blood vessels, but they have these plaques are called amyloid plaques, which are toxic. They form outside of the neurons and they're toxic uh, to these brain neurons. So this is healthy tissue and this is uh, disease tissue. Uh, we haven't done a trial on Alzheimer's, but I'll show you with Parkinson's, we're able to protect and regenerate the neurons in Parkinson's uh, diseased animals and also remove aggregated proteins that accumulate in the brains of these monkeys that have Parkinson's disease. But getting back to Alzheimer's, uh, most people felt that these guys were the cause and uh, if we could dissolve these or attack these and get rid of them, this would perhaps reverse Alzheimer's disease. Probably 50 clinical trials have been done trying to get rid of this amyloid plaque and all have failed. So it's been a real disappointment. Uh, and we believe by going after what we believe is a root cause, reestablishing blood flow, uh, that we could <clears throat> at least have a better crack at this. And we're encouraged by a study that was done uh, in McGill University. They looked at over 1,000 patients with Alzheimer's disease. Okay, a huge study. Looked at almost 8,000 brain images. Uh, and they looked at such things as the beta amyloid uh, glucose metabolism, structural properties, but importantly, they looked at blood flow. So this is what we are interested in. Is there any change in blood flow with Alzheimer's disease? And remarkably, what they found is shown here on the next slide. This is a little bit busy, but what they were looking at are abnormalities. What's going on? What's abnormal in Alzheimer's disease? And this is the progression of the D. Some early disease, they went out 30 years. This is late onset Alzheimer's disease, okay? So what's going on with Alzheimer's? Well, we know there's memory decline. This is memory decline. 
Uh, beta amyloid is here. But look at the very first thing that goes wrong in Alzheimer's. It's this line right here, vascular, okay? So what they showed was that these people have a defective blood flow in their brains. The very first thing that occurs before any cognitive decline, loss of memory, um, amyloid deposition. <clears throat> so in our clinical trial, which we hope to do uh, early next year, is to treat early onset Alzheimer's patients with something which can stimulate uh, new blood vessel growth in the brain and hopefully delay or reverse some of these later occurring uh, symptoms in Alzheimer's. Okay, Parkinson's disease. This is different from Alzheimer's. This affects only a very tiny uh, number of brain, uh, neurons in your brain. And I'll show you that on the next slide. So deep in your brain, uh, this is deep within your, uh, close to the brain stem, a small region of dopamine producing neurons. Okay, it's substantia nigra region. Nigra means black, so these are dopamine neurons are blackish. If you can visualize them. <clears throat> uh, they make dopamine, and dopamine is critical for normal movement of our bodies. And in Parkinson's, these neurons begin dying off, less dopamine is produced, and you get the characteristic uh, movement disorder seen in Parkinson's. Now, you can use novel imaging technology, uh, MRI, and actually look at blood perfusion in this very tiny area of the brain. And this study shows in that small area of the brain, what a healthy 21-year-old looks like, a healthy 65-year-old, less blood flow than a 21-year-old, but still enough uh, to keep those dopamine cells healthy. But in Parkinson's, we see about a 50% reduction in blood perfusion. This is what we think is causing the death of those neurons, the dopamine neurons. And if we can restore blood flow, say back to this level, that we could reverse those symptoms of Parkinson's. Uh, and I'll show you that, that we've done that in two animal models of Parkinson's. Also in Parkinson's, uh, one of the first things that occurs is a loss of smell, speech is affected. Uh, you get <clears throat> things going on in memory. Uh, and again, this is due to a lack of blood flow in these areas of the brain. Uh, you can use that same functional MRI to look at. Uh, this is a woman who had Parkinson's with dementia. Uh, blue is normal blood flow, yellow is decreased, red is severely decreased. These are areas involved in memory and co executive functioning. Again, lack of blood flow. Uh, we feel if we gave this person our drug, we could stimulate blood flow not only to the motor <coughs> neurons, the dopamine neurons, but also to these areas as well. Let me quickly just show you some of the animal data. You can give rats and monkeys Parkinson's disease. You give them a toxin. It destroys their dopamine cells, and they come down with classical movement disorders that are seen in people. Uh, so these are motor skill testing scores on various motor skills. Normal animal, you give them this toxin, they develop Parkinson's-like disease. Motor scores are much lower. With our drug, FGF1, they come back not to normal, but we about 50% of normal. Uh, these animals are doing better in their motor score testing than, than <clears throat> the untreated animals. Now, very importantly, if you look in the brains of those rats in that substantia nigra region where the dopamine cells are, we're regenerating dopamine neurons. They stain brown here. See in the treated animals, we're actually regenerating those neurons, and we think this leads to the better motor scores in these animals. So it's, we believe, affecting the root cause of Parkinson's disease. Uh, here's a cute little monkey, a marmoset. Again, you can give marmosets the same toxin, and they will develop over a period of months all the classical symptoms of Parkinson's. This is the toxin. It's actually a herbicide uh, given to the animals over eight months. Their movement, their motor scores are decreasing. Uh, if you don't treat them with anything, they keep decreasing. But if you treat them at this point with FGF1, this is our product, you see it reverses that decrease, and you actually get some improvement. Not back to normal, but these animals are doing much better in their movement scores than, than these animals. Yes? 
I'll show you that because we submitted this to the FDA and it's over a, a period of weeks that we're doing our first trial with. So much different than we're doing in the heart. But I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Let me just show you again. We're uh, in the monkeys now. In the monkeys' brains, you can look for these dopamine cells regenerating. And clearly there's new dopamine cells in the brains of these animals, which we believe leads to their better motor functioning. I mentioned toxic proteins in Alzheimer's disease. There's a toxic protein in Parkinson's. It's called synuclein. Here it is. This is this aggregated protein in the brains. We see this in people as well as these monkeys. And with treatment, you can see you decrease the amount of that toxic protein, uh, not again to normal, but certainly a decrease from this level. And again, we think this leads to the improvement in these uh, animals as well. Again, a disease-modifying effect of this drug in Parkinson's. Uh, we've submitted our clinical trial to the FDA. They've approved of this study where we'll be studying three rising doses of the drug. All the patients will get it uh, for six weeks. They get it for six weeks every day. Uh, and about 5% of the drug will get through the blood-brain barrier. So we've studied that in animals. Okay, so that's our first trial. We can do similar trials with all these diseases, and we will uh, as we get sufficient funding into the company. We're, we're starting with Parkinson's, Lou Gehrig's disease, but we hope to launch uh, Alzheimer's and MS uh, next year. Uh, we're starting the Parkinson's, we'll be starting that uh, in Mexico and also hopefully in Estonia before we start our US study. Okay, and finally, I want to end up with, uh, this is work coming out of Columbia University Medical School, that uh, aging and cognitive decline in normal people like us may be due to a lack of blood flow. And uh, I'll skip that. But So Columbia University uh, did a study. Time Health did a little video clip on their study because they thought it was so interesting. And let me just end with that. Okay, this new study explains why our brains perform worse as we age. They looked at 28 healthy people uh, who had died suddenly from accidents. From 14 years to 80 years of age. So they looked at the number, mainly they were looking at stem cells, not brain cells, but stem cells mainly, again, in the memory part of the brain. So older people made as many of these stem cells in the memory parts of the brain as younger ones do. Okay, but what is different? Reduced blood flow in the aging brain. Okay, again, what we're talking about. So in the older brain, these stem cells are dividing less and they're generating fewer these newer neurons. So, in us older people, there uh, we have these pool of brain cells are just not as active as they are in the younger folks. So, the New York Columbia researchers suggested that it might be possible to combat age-related cognitive decline uh, for able to improve blood flow to the brain. We agree completely with this. Uh, we probably aren't going to start an anti-aging study at the moment, but certainly it was on our radar screen that perhaps this could also be preventative in, in an aging population, normal aging population. Uh, thank you very much. Uh,